Next up, we are having for an encore to the second segment today on the topic of employment, equity, and the evolution of the workplace. What's working and what's not? We have a keynote presentation from Dr. Dinesh Palipana, OAM. Dinesh is a doctor, lawyer, disability advocate, and researcher who was the first quadriplegic medical intern in Queensland. Halfway through medical school, he was involved in an accident causing cervical spine and cord injury. Still, he completed an advanced clerkship in radiology at, the Harvard, at Harvard University and be prepared for feeling very underaccomplished. <clears throat> Dinesh works in the ER department at Gold Coast University Hospital. He's a senior lecturer at Griffith University, adjunct research fellow at the Menzies Health Institute of Queensland, a researcher in spinal cord injury, a doctor for the Gold Coast Titans physical disability rugby team, a senior advisor to the Disability Royal Commission, an ambassador to the Human Rights Commission's Includability Program, and in 2021, the International Day of People, and Dis of, of People with Disability, became, he was anointed as an ambassador. He's also a founding member of Doctors with Disabilities in Australia, and he's the third Australian to be awarded a Henry Vic Vicardi Achievement Award, and in 2021 as well, the Griffith University Young Alumnus of the Year. There's more, there's so much more. But he's joining us live, and I would love for you to welcome Dinesh in his oration. Well, what's working and what's not, thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, due to some logistical uh, requirements, I'm actually joining you from the car park of the Randwick uh, race course in Sydney. So it's a, it's a very interesting place to chat with you from. I'm uh, really grateful for this opportunity to join the New Kind Conference, which I think is a... All right, hopefully I'm back. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Thanks, Dinesh. Great. great. Sorry. Uh, so I also just learned that you shouldn't leave your phone in the sun. It overheats and then the Wi-Fi drops. So, guys, uh, thank you again for having me. And um, over the weekend, I uh, was working in the emergency department. I work in the busiest emergency department in Australia. And uh, I had an amazing moment. Uh, on Sunday night, I had a pregnant mom come in. So she was uh, in her first trimester of pregnancy and uh, she was worried that she was about to have a miscarriage. So I've been, um, I've, I have a spinal cord injury and I lost the use of my fingers and everything below the chest in 2010. And it was actually Irfan's family who was so close to me that uh, helped me through this journey in such a big way and uh, have always made me feel uh, always made me feel empowered but nonetheless um, I made it my my way back to medical school and today I'm in my seventh year nearly as a doctor but as a part of uh, working in the emergency department one of the things I've been doing is using different kinds of tools and using technology to make my practice better so I had this mom, she was uh, having, uh, she was worried that she was having a miscarriage and she was so distressed. And uh, there were tears, there was fear. Uh, and uh, this, little, this little baby's dad was there and you could see the sadness in their face. Uh, so I had a little ultrasound in my pocket and it's a tool that I've been using more and more because it's something that's allowed me to bridge the physical gaps that I have. And so I whipped out the ultrasound, which connects to my phone, and I put it on the mum's belly. And voila, we could see the baby's heartbeat, and it was okay. The look on that mum's face is something that I can't even explain. And to me, it's one of the best moments in medicine. But uh, I took the, took the video of that little heartbeat, the little baby, and I airdropped it to her. And uh, she went home happy, feeling safe that the baby's doing okay. So these kind of tools that I've started to use has not just helped me, but it makes medicine better. It's better for the patients. It's more efficient in a stretched healthcare system. And you know what? It's not just about medicine. It's about 
all professions, all areas of human endeavor, because we're so conservative as a society, right? But when we bring different people into it, when we bring people with disability, when we bring culturally and linguistically diverse people, when we bring different mindsets into medicine, we start to evolve, we start to adapt, we start to do things differently, and eventually it becomes better for it. As Henry Ford says, if everyone is thinking the same, then no one is thinking. At least I think that's, that was Henry Ford or someone. Uh, so I think having different perspectives is really critically important for our evolution, for progress, and for making things better in our society. But I also learned the single most uh, challenging barrier that seeks to stop this, that seeks to stop inclusion, that seeks to stop diversity. And you know what that is? It's human attitudes. When I was moving forward in my career, uh, I had so many different attitudes. A lot of people said uh, I could never be a doctor again. A lot of people said that I would not be able to get around a hospital using a wheelchair. A lot of people said that I would not be able to practice medicine, not being able to use my fingers. Some said that patients would not take me seriously. Guess what? I've seen thousands of patients now, uh, in my seventh year now, and not one of those patients has ever said, can you do your job? Not one of those patients has ever said, I feel unsafe with you. In fact, the feedback has been amazing, and as far as I know, the customer is happy. And let me tell you, I work in Gold Coast, right? Some have even tried to seduce me in the middle of the night. But I think uh, we're, we're at the new kind conference, right? And I think kindness is important. And I think persistence is important. As they say, uh, we turn the other cheek and we keep going. One of the nicest stories that I have to share with you from my medical career is from my first year as a doctor. Uh, I was working with um, a, a surgeon. So we have to do all sorts of different rotations. And one of them was surgery. So I started fresh young doctor. I was terrified uh, because the surgeon was an old school, scary guy who used to yell at people. And I was terrified, right? I didn't know. I'm like, man, I'm in a wheelchair. I don't know how he's going to take me. So I started my first day. I looked over. I, I, was, I, was, I was sweating. But I spent my surgical term. And I got to the end of it. And this surgeon uh, sat me down. Well, I was already sitting down. He sat down. And uh, gave me my performance review. And he said, you know, when I first heard that you were coming to my service, I was really skeptical. I didn't know how this was going to work. And I had so many thoughts. But today, I'm here. And I'm ashamed that I thought that way because our time together has made me think differently about what a doctor should look like and what a doctor can do. And that's it, isn't it? It's just changing the life and heart at a time. It's being, it's being visible. It's being there. It's about us getting into the system. It's about enabling other people to be in the system. It's about enabling one person at a time. And this will eventually create a snowball effect. And this will create a change over time. I know we have so many different policies and guidelines and strategies and even laws that try to create systemic change. But I truly believe when it comes to employment and education, it's really just about one person at a time. And if all of us that share this day together today can get one person into the system, and that one person creates a change, that's enough. In 10, 20 years, we will see more and everyone won't be thinking the same and our society will be better for it. Thank you so much for having me this morning.
Thank you, Dinesh. I, don't, I think we've, we have lost this connection, but I'm, we're, we're very grateful to have had someone as authentic and as brilliant and impacting as him to, to, to start the proceedings for this next session, which, to remind you, is employment, equity and the evolution of the workplace, what's working and what's not. And following on from what Dinesh has inferred to about individual, you know, appreciating the individual experience and impact of what diverse breadth brings to the workplace and how to manage that cost, we have some incredible panellists again. The first person I'll call up is Sheetal Dio. Sheetal, yes, Sheetal's here, great. She's a lawyer by qualification and an, advocacy, an advocate by choice. Sheetal is passionate about access to education and legal services and occupies several roles which she uses to facilitate her passion and drive social impact. When she isn't advocating on behalf of her, law, her lawyer peers, she's working alongside them to advocate on behalf of members from underrepresented and marginalised communities through her private practice, Shakti Legal Solutions, which she launched in February 2020 as a means to improve access to justice. And she works with a network of firms to ensure her clients get the help they need within their means when they need it. Next up, we have May Sanani. May is a... <laughs> May is a professionally certified leadership coach, facilitator, researcher, venture partner, and business founder. She's passionate about investing in people and ideas that can transform the world. And drawing on more than a decade of international experience as a lawyer, impact investor, and tech nonprofit CEO, she founded the Human Leadership Lab to help individuals and organizations identify their purpose and unleash their power and potential. In, in addition, she is also a senior industry fellow at Forward RMIT's University Center for Future Skills and Workforce Transformation, as you can see, perfectly situated to be on our panel. Third up, we have someone who's familiar to many of you, who is Shankar Kasyanathan. Over... <clears throat> Over the past 20 years, Shankar, not Shankar, just FYI, has accumulated experiences in youth services, housing, public health, multicultural and indigenous affairs oof, across Victoria, Western Australia and Northern Territory and the ACT. In one capacity or another, he's worked for local governments, Transparency International, Oxfam, National Heart Foundation, Amnesty and Red Cross, and been an advisor to state and territory members of parliament. Um, but now he's also a Victorian Commissioner of Multicultural Affairs and Dep Chair of the Migrant Workers Centre. Ken, we're going to have some powerful conversations here. And we couldn't... We have one more seat there, and that is for Irfan Daliri, who we just met in our previous panel. No, no, I'll, st I'll stand here, Irfan, it's fine. The water. Sorry, thanks. Sorry. Sorry. The water. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us on this panel for this conversation. I mean, obviously, if you were here prior to this, you'd know that racism and systemic impact and how it bleeds through so many different levels of our lives and spheres clearly impacts the workplace example as well. And I want to start with a question that kind of segues from last panel to this panel. And within each of your praxis, I want to I ask you this one. It's a bit of context. So, and it sort of echoes one of the last questions, or one of the first questions that was asked earlier. Diversity and inclusion initiatives play an insidious role in the workplace, in institutions that tend to tokenise marginalised groups to increase their profitability and brand value. Ultimately, d &I initiatives can be seen as designed to further or embolden the institutional power structures and increase capital worth and profit. So diverse empires are still empires, people say. <laughs> but from a colonial perspective, people with marginalised identities have always been recruited by empires and institutions. As leaders, how do we ensure we are not merely participating in being the diverse faces of a neoliberal colonial capitalist regime, but actually vying for radical dismantling of the structures that surround us. So just something light to get us. <laughs> A round of applause for that question. <laughs> I'll, start, I'll start with you, Shibu. Where do you see the power of one 
in dismantling the workplace systemic racism? I think we were starting off with um, being visible representation is baseline. I think being able to penetrate those spaces um, sometimes can often be enough. And I say that in the context of I was having a conversation with someone um, just this morning about this saying, well, I don't really do any of the advocacy work. I kind of just hold space in um, a, a policy space. And it's a lot of white male, pale, stale males, whatever the saying is now. <laughs> we know what um, you mean. We know what you mean. Pardon? We know what you mean. Yes. Um, and and my, my suggestion to her was that even just being in that space is important. Um, just holding that space, claiming that space is important. Um, I only stepped into the, the DEI space or the JEDI space or whatever the acronym they want to use for doing the right thing space is um, <laughs> because I was really tired of seeing white women hold up spaces to talk about things they had no lived experience about. Um, and I don't have professional training like many of the people here have. I, I just have my lived experience and that is enough sometimes, a lot of the times, to just help educate and help people understand and, and bring them along the journey um, and start shifting mindsets slowly. Um, and for me, uh, that's been an effective way of just in the circles of influence and change that I have and leveraging the hell of whatever platform I have access to. If you hire me because I'm your diversity hire, I couldn't care less because you'll see me leverage the crap out of that place um, to the point where you'll see, oh, there's value in having someone from a diverse background. Uh, because the worst thing that happens is um, in the DEI recruitment space is this concept of adding diversity and stir for this cocktail of um, unleashing the power of diversity and that doesn't really work. Um, unless you have a inclusive and psychologically safe space, you're not gonna get someone to share that. Um, so for me, it's been, I understand why you've brought me into this space, but I can't actually do what you need me to do in the systems and structures that you have. Um, and in order for me to be able to share that, these are the things that I need changed or these are the things that need to be changed in order for more people like me to step into this space. Um, so that's kind of been my experience. Right. Do um, May or Chagra Lich Fund, would you want to respond to that as well? Yeah, my experience has certainly been similar, which is that it's not enough to be doing DEI, DIB Jedi work without addressing the fundamental disparities of power within organizations. And I'm someone that works within capitalist systems. Mm -hmm. And I've found one of the most powerful ways is to have conversations about power and privilege and if I need to use ways of entering the system that serve me, I will, yeah. <laughs> um, to get access to that. And a lot of the time, I think it was referred to yesterday, which is um, we can't do, for example, mindset training with leaders, or we cannot do um, initiatives related to bringing out the best talent in our organizations without actually addressing the disparities of power. And so if my entry is into working with a CEO and thinking about how can they be the best CEO, we will talk about power and privilege. Hmm. And that is not necessarily the conversation that they signed up for, but in my opinion and in my experience, that's been a way for me to bring that to the agenda. Hmm. If I am the token hire or if I am the person that can help them actually be the best CEO possible, that means they have to dismantle the power systems that they're in and often it means acknowledging that there's been historical disadvantage, that there are voices that are not heard. I think in terms of the fabric of an organization itself, one of my favorite things to do is to embed accountability within the st structure and system itself. And so I think that one of the most powerful ways we can do that is to use the language of values, which is often espoused by organizations, put on a sexy poster and put on the wall, which is that if it is that, for example, our values are respect or inclusion or honesty, how do we actually take these values and operationalize them into observable behaviors? And how do we actually put these into the performance metrics of our individuals, teams, and organizations so that we're held accountable? And this kind of references the work of Brené Brown's of the world that says, you've got to take values from BS to actual behavior. We need to be accountable. What are we seeing, hearing, noticing in our organizations? And what are the consequences for actually breaching our values? How will we measure it? How will we know that someone's breached it? And are we willing to actually 
ask people to leave if they aren't being honest, if they're not including voices. And so this might look like in practice, if we say that we value honesty, that we talk to people, not about them. If we value inclusion, we bring all voices to the table and hear from them before we make decisions. So part of the work that I, I'm doing these days is working with the system to dismantle it from within, mm -hmm. but also help the system hold itself accountable, mm -hmm. often using, using its own language. Mm -hmm. nice. Nice. So I guess now that we've established that you know, we can use, uh, we, we, uh, as, as people of colour within systems and infrastructures, there is potentially space that we can leverage to our advantage on our terms we're using our voice. But so much of that has to do, for many of us in the workplace, with well-being and how we're actually functioning in general. Mm. And I wanted to ask, and Ashanka, I'll start with you on this one. It's more to do, well, to do with the well-being lens here. Quiet quitting is a symbol of something not working in our systems, affecting people from across boundaries. It's growing weary of self-optimisation and over-delivering inhumane work practices, racism at work, expectations. What do you think are the biggest failures of the workplace as we know? And how has this managed to go unchallenged for so long despite us living in a progressive age? Mm. So quiet quitting is something that I think many of us can relate to. Um, I've certainly quite quit many places in the workplaces which have had deeply entrenched uh, problems around discrimination, around mm. tokenising people of colour and lived experience. Uh, and, and if you know my CV, um, you don't have to imagine which organisations I'm referring to. Um, I think that one of the biggest problems that we have and one of the issues that can, continues to persist is that we don't still seem to understand what diversity is. We don't still seem to value what actual inclusion and diversity is. We talk about it. We might have entire units or positions which have been resourced to look at that question. But I don't think at the core many organisations actually fully still appreciate it. Mm. Because if we did appreciate it, if we did actually understand what diversity can bring to our workplaces, Will we be having the conversations that we're having? Will we be sitting there trying to decipher between allyship as a word or accomplice as a word? I think that we've got to this point because we are still having the same conversations because we have not understood the meaning of diversity and the value of it. My, we've talked to Tasneem a, a lot, I think, the last two days about whiteness. My earliest memory in life is the image of an old white man strapping me into a seatbelt when my family and I arrived in this country from the airport. Norm and his family played a critical role in being accomplices to bring us into this country safely. When I was 14, it was a white man who prevented me from self-harming as a deeply troubled young man in high school. When I was 18, 19, it was a white man who played a heavy role in trying to get me my first job in local government. So I think this notion, we've talked a little bit about allyship and we've talked a little bit about accomplices and people that we need, we need to work with us side by side in dismantling within or from outside. And so when I look at what is the problem that is persisting, it's the fact that far too many people don't know why we're doing the work we're doing. Mm. Far, people, far too many people haven't stopped and given themselves a chance to take a breath and go, what is our why in this work? The departments of the state government, and particularly the departments that have the sole responsibility to foster, nurture and celebrate multicultural communities, are some of the most psychologically and culturally unsafe workplaces in this state. Why? How does that even exist? How is that even possible? If we haven't actually stopped and asked and answer that question for ourselves, why is diversity and inclusion even important? Irfan, Thank you. would you care to respond? I'm just here to grin and nod. There's <laughs> <laughs> so much expertise on this panel. I don't want to take up too much time on this one. But um, I share Shankar's 
passion and frustration with the slowness. And I think you're right. We are having the same conversations over and over and over again. We're you know, overlooking the obvious. Um, and this, the, the fact that we even have to prove the benefit of diversity to an organization or institution proves the fact that it's still self-serving mm -hmm. and we are still playing into the hands of oppressive systems and structures that we need to allow them to recognize our humanity or to understand uh, the worth and the value that we bring before they can actually authentically include us. And I, it's hogwash to me. It's, like it, it's still resting upon the same pillar of, of cultural superiority. Um, and, and that's why we're flirting around it and we have to prove to them our worth and how you can improve productivity or engagement or you know, attract better talent if you have diverse staff on your board, blah, blah, blah. It proves the point that it's self-serving and self-righteous. The other thing quickly is diversity is a fact of life. It's a mm. natural law of the universe and its lack is what is abnormal and dysfunctional. So like, can we just have that conversation as well? Like we love to celebrate our multicultural country here, but then there's an absence, an absolute absence of, of diversity in senior leadership positions, government, corporate, not-for-profit, settlement services, whatever it happens to be. So like that absence is what we need to question really, not proving our value to your system. Can I add two things Please. to that? Just yes. one thing is um, with the, part of the question you asked is why is quiet quitting now such a big issue? Because it started affecting white men. White men started to leave their job. Great resignation started to happen. We've been doing it or we've been trying to do it or we've been prevented from doing it because we have to work so much more harder um, to retain it and get those positions to begin with. So it's actually a, a privilege to be average. It's a privilege to be mediocre in your jobs. Doesn't it's not though, a privilege uh, we have. Doesn't the in, in endurance of people of color, though, sit well with employers who look at that as resilience, right? Oh, as good work. worker bees, definitely. But do you see many of us on the leadership boards no. to make those decisions? Absolutely not. We're, we're the good workers. Um, it, it, the, the other thing I wanted to just add um, quickly to the uh, diversity thing is, we don't have a diversity problem in Australia. We have an inclusion problem in Australia. Mm -hmm. And it's in every industry. We're there, we're everywhere. Look, this demographic that's here is across every industry, but not in the decision-making roles. And that's an inclusion problem. That's not a diversity problem. So I think we really need to look in the way May does it with the value system and using the language. If you want to do it as a DEI initiative, great. If you want to do it as coaching, great. I'll use the language that you understand. It's like love languages, right? So I'll speak to you in a language you understand to communicate what needs to be communicated because you're just not getting it. We've been having this discussion for 30 decades and pardon my ignorance, I'm young in the game or new to the game. So I'm just chipping at it whichever way I can because the generation before us, my parents were, didn't have these discussions. They were migrants to Canada um, and they were just grateful to have a space. Our generation has the audacity of equality. The next generation has just no tolerance for it. So we, it's just, you're either inclusive or we're not interested. We won't silent quit, we just won't come to your organization. And that's gonna to be to your detriment. Um, and we're seeing that shift now. I would even go so far to say that quiet quitting is not quiet at all. It's quite loud. <laughs> And quite quitting is really a reclamation of power. Mm -hmm. um, as Chatal was saying, I think that the burnout, the exhaustion, being a human being on planet Earth in 2022 is freaking hard work. And we can't ignore the fact that all around us there's external stimulus, which is you know, b making our brains go on high alert. We're exhausted, our brains are exhausted, our nervous systems are exhausted. And so part of this quiet quitting or loud quitting is I refuse for work to be my entire life anymore. Mm -hmm. And I will dictate the terms of how work fits into my life. And I'm seeing this not only in bad organizations, but I'm seeing perfectly functioning, good intending, well-functioning organizations have a lot of quiet quitting happen because it is a reclamation of our agency and power as human beings mm -hmm. that work plays a role in my life, but it is not my whole life. And in fact, my why or my my purpose is beyond this. 
is beyond this workplace. And I think that's really exciting. So there is a silver lining. I think quite quitting is often used to stigmatize employees for not doing enough work, but I also see it as a reclamation. Yeah. I think that's a perfect segue to my next question, May, which you know she can respond to as well, is how do we decentralize our self-worth and identity to create healthier boundaries and relationships with workplaces and the systems that be? Like, How can we avoid attaching our worth to achieving excellence within an exploitative working environment? <laughs> it's, a, it's a big and great question. One of the fundamental misunderstandings is that we are human doings. We are not human doings, we're human beings. And the Dalai Lama famously used this quote to describe some of our distraction, I think, as human beings. And I think one of the things we see a lot, particularly in leadership, is that I, my worth is my role. I was guilty of this. I ticked a lot of boxes in my first couple decades of my life, and I hit 30 and I thought, to what end? <laughs> and it, it maybe took getting fired, getting broken up with, almost getting deported from the US to realize I am not my role. I am more than my role. I am May. What does that actually mean? And I think that, interestingly, this is not a unique experience. This is an experience that a lot of us go through. A lot of the work comes from helping people recognize that their worth is not through their contribution as a capitalist, exploited worker, but in terms of how they live their lives. And so the, the language I use is it's more important how you be and who you be rather than what you do. Mm -hmm. Because how you be, the values of our human skills, our resilience, our empathy, our ability to have difficult conversations actually is the foundation for what we do and, and you know, what we get done in the workplace, how we bring people together. And so I think that's the fundamental distinction we've got to get, we've got to get right. We get tired, we get scared, a lot of the fear comes from losing our roles because we collapse role and self into one and we need to fundamentally separate them again. And the systems we're in benefit from doing this, we need to keep doing this. Right, and I think to a large extent we've, we've echoed that systems are also set up to keep us in our lane and for those of us who are presenting from diverse communities, it's even harder to articulate that worth um, unless you're seen as the unacceptable migrant and the upstart Fun. how do then people of colour within workplaces who are you know, navigating well-being and endurance at a time of upheaval? Now, it's, it's interesting with quiet quitting as a topic. It's mm. almost as if you know, white people who can leave at this time and call it a, a burden and a phenomenon uh, can own a hashtag like quiet quitting mm. and for it to be socially acceptable, whereas if it were people of colour who were enduring this, it would be like, well, they're, burnt, they're, just, they're just burnt out. Yeah. So we, we almost we almost color code the way that we describe endurance. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. It would be it would be deflected as, as oh, it's a cultural thing, you know. That you know, it's, toughen it's, up. Yeah, toughen up. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there's also the, risk, the the stereotype risk, right? So we're constantly mm -hmm. fighting stereotype risk, which is the you know predetermined prejudice stereotypes that exist about us. We're constantly having to overwork for less recognition because we don't want to risk the potentiality of falling into the stereotype. Of, of being this type of person, that type of person. So we are already working twice as much for half as much. And then if we do eventually at any point in time succumb to the same things that, as you said, largely straight white males are now quitting, that's why we call it a phenomena. If we eventually succumb to that, then we suddenly become susceptible to the prodigious threat, the stereotype threat, and then we re represent our entire ethnic group, mm. which is part of the problems that we need to really be discussing, is that why is it that only coloured folks represent their entire ethnic group and Western, white Australians, Americans, Canadians never at any point are deemed to be representing their entire ethnic group. They're always uh, treated as individuals. Um, that's something, that's a dynamic we need to unpack and talk about and, and address as well. Mm. Okay. Yeah, if I quit, it's because I couldn't cut it as a lawyer, a yeah. junior and lawyer, all, a woman of colour. Like but like you if you my, my white colleague does it, it's called quite quitting now? Like, yeah. give me a break. <laughs> True, exactly that. Um, so, Shankar, as a collectivist species, how can we redesign from the ground up a working world that is, which is innately, innately harmful, unsustainable and built for profit at all costs? It's competitive, it's monotonous, it's, it's arduous, it's repetitive and glorifies sacrifice and compromise, living for the weekend. How do we begin to design a workplace that optimises people 
and self-actualization, aligning to our well-being needs. So when I was, um, I remember, Tasmanian, when I was just about to be offered a job at Amnesty International, um, mm. it was such a very long lead up to the, the offer, lots of hurdles, and I developed a kind of a twitching eye because uh, mm. I was so nervous and anxious about getting this job. I'm sharing this story because we've all experienced that almost Hunger Games-like environment <laughs> that's involved in getting a job in this country and getting a job uh, fighting for our communities and advocating mm. for our communities in these roles that, you know, I think I'm the first, I was the first former refugee in a refugee rights campaign, a role in, in Amnesty International in this country, right? So there's this notion of the fact that each and every one of us struggles for that opportunity and fights for that opportunity, irrespective of what qualifications we have and what experience we've, you know. Now imagine the voices that aren't in the room. Migrant, refugee, asylum seeker workers who are living in regional rural areas mm. or anywhere in this country or state who have to fight for those opportunities and jobs. There is this incredible tension, right, between on one hand the fact that each and every one of us here at Newkind do want to dismantle the society in which deeply entrenched institutional racism exists. And on the other hand, there is a migrant worker going to work today who's going to be working 20 hours and needs that job desperately. And how do we navigate that tension? How do we look at it? What's, what makes this dilemma, what makes this tension so much more of a struggle to comprehend is that we do have this almost two-world society where you've got the corporate you know, world and you've got the grad programs in the public service where a, a staff member comes in is a new recruit, and it's an enormous investment in that worker, right? You, you map out their journey, you give them the opportunity, the sort of really clear pathway of where they're going to go in their career, right? There's a lot of coaching, for example. You know, in the corporate world, there's a thing called executive coaching. Can you imagine if you went to a migrant worker working at a farm in Gippsland and said, hey, would you like an executive coach? They'd be like, I'd just like to work seven hours today. That would be, you know, a start in the right direction and be paid minimum wages. So I think that we have to first accept the tension that exists between wanting to progress and to address the systematic issues that we have with the dire realities of many of our migrant refugee asylum seeker workers in this state, with the two-world syndrome of, on, in one hand, there is all these resources to support employees to, to, to grow and to evolve, and then there is the not-for-profit sector and other spaces uh, in our society, where, um, where it's, it's literally like Hunger Games every day, and the quiet quitting happens, and as you said, maybe not so quiet quitting um, en masse uh, <laughs> at times when things get really, really, really bad. So, Tasneem, I think the question that I think about is what can we do collectively as a society to think about the fact that let's progress and recognise that for some of our friends, some of our community, they're not going to be as loud as we are, they're not going to be as resourceful as we are. They're not going to have the opportunities and the privileges that you and I might have uh, to journey on this road towards more inclusive, safer and fairer workplaces. Thank you. May, <laughs> May and Sheetal, you both, you know, you run your own businesses to a large extent. I mean, if, we, if we're talking about, you know, redesigning from the ground up workplaces that centre optimisation of people and not profit. How do you do that? I think um, Shakti uh, is, is the firm that I created and it was based off of my experience of um, if my parents needed to access legal services, we wouldn't qualify for legal aid and there's no way my dad would go to a firm like Minter Ellison uh, to go get legal services because it's, we're automatically priced out. Um, so. I created the firm with the intention of deconstructing the traditional law firm structure. Um, and it, it's focused on addressing the missing middle. And, and the reason why I use this as a case study, not only because the promotion is good, um, but also because it's nothing new. The access to justice issue is not new. I've been in the profession for seven years. I started the firm four years after being in the profession. Access to justice has been an issue 
May, you can attest to this, because you've been in the profession longer than I have. For years and years and years, as long as there's been a justice system, there's been an access to justice issue. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not a new concept, and there have been studies and research, and universities have given multiple grants to research what the issues are. Um, and by lived experience, I ultimately created a firm that was people-driven. By talking to community, I understood what their barriers were. I feel lawyers are too expensive. Great. Cool transparency. I'll pay what you can. I'll make services available. I, I cover my means. I cover what I need to, and that's it. The association of value to the billable hour, the higher my billable hour is, the better the lawyer I am, is ridiculous. I charge 50 bucks an hour for some legal work, and I challenge you to tell me my worth is 50 bucks an hour as a lawyer, because it's not. And it's only when we decenter that self-worth and say, my value is the impact I have for this individual, this individual who's trying to come to this country, this individual who's trying to access the NDIS and is acting against a government agency represented by Minter Ellison. And they have no capacity to do that on their own. Um, when we focus on people and impact, I think we start building structures that serve that, rather than looking at existing structures and saying, how do I, and in some instances, I suppose it, it can be, but in my circumstances, I created the firm because I didn't see anything like what I wanted to do. I wanted to work as much or as little as I wanted, and I wanted to charge as much or as little as I wanted, and I could not find a firm in Australia that facilitated that. So I did it because I just wanted to be able to help my friends and family and the immediate people in my circle to access legal help. It's not innovative, but apparently it is because it's being touted as an innovative law firm design. And I'm like, this is silly. This is, it's just listening to people from diverse backgrounds about what they need and building a service around that. So I, it's not difficult. I just, it doesn't, it, maybe it doesn't serve the capitalist agenda and that's why it's not popular. Um, because I'm trying to, you nailed it right yeah, there. I'm trying to push this low bono concept across Australia, across Queensland, and it's not that I'm the first person who's had a low, low bono law firm. They've been doing it for years before me, but the uptake of it is is low because why would you want to charge fifty bucks an hour when you can charge five hundred, right? Hmm. Because it's the right thing to do, and not everyone can pay five hundred bucks an hour. Incredible. So, Incredible. yeah. Thank you. double, triple tick to everything Shadal said. I think there's probably three main places I'd go. One is conceptual to a quite practical and tactical. The first is, and this is some of the research that's been done and led by Helen Babdilia, who's sitting here as well, um, through the RMIT Forward organization, which is looking at future skills. And Helen leads the work stream around not your parents' workplace. and. One of the, the papers that we co-authored recently was around this idea that we should not be separating inclusion from leadership. We should not be even using the language of inclusive leadership. It's not an add-on. It's not optional. Mm -hmm. Leadership is not a noun, it's a verb. In the same way that we were talking about anti-racism being a verb, it's something you do. Leadership is something you do, it's not what you are or what you have. And so inclusive leadership, is a misnomer because you cannot be a leader and lead without being inclusive. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing we need to do. We need to change the way we define leadership. We need to think about what we're teaching in MBA, in MPP programs, how we espouse leadership, what we put up as the models of leadership. And we need to think about this in our capitalist organizations as well. The second thing, and I see this with really well-intentioned leaders that I work with, is taking definitions of high performance that were actually intended in terms of the research and the findings to measure group performance, high performance as a group, as a collective, and we've reduced it down to the individual level. So we've taken definitions of what a high performing team is, reduced it to the individual level, and what that creates is this Hunger Games, tit for tat, my strength is your weakness and I must take and give. And that is the wrong way to be measuring success and performance in our organization. So one of the things that we can do in our organizations is to have metrics for measuring collective success. And this is really, really important 
because it's not just a, a touchy-feely, woo-woo, we're good people. It actually affects the business bottom line. And so to go back to using the system against itself, <laughs> if we actually want more profit, um, this is the way. But if we also want to treat people as humans, with the dignity of humans, this is the way. And this is because Google's Project Aristotle, which looked at what makes high-performing and effective teams, measured all kinds of variables across all kinds of industries, group sizes, from interns up to the C-suite. And the number one factor impacting effective teams was psychological safety. Do I feel safe to take risks? in this organization? Does my team have my back? Can I make mistakes? Can I admit that I don't know the answer or I don't understand the question? And that is a quality that is not individual. You cannot have psychological safety in a vacuum. It's within a group context. And the, peop the reason that people are leaving on in troves, the, the work of Charles Soule from MIT Press shows that people are leaving workplaces because of their toxicity. And toxicity, the, the, the two main definitions of it are disrespect and lack of inclusion. Mm -hmm. Now, people are leaving toxic workplaces at 10 times the rate than for any other reason, including compensation or not having opportunities for advancement. So this is both a human problem and a business problem. So that we really, really need to redesign the way we measure our performance based on co the collective. And I'd say the last thing we need to do is we need to create organizations or talk about work in our organizations that acknowledges we are reflections of the society we're in. We're not immune to society. It's not despite people's identities. We are a reflection of it. And so employee activism is something we want to promote, we want to talk about, we want to acknowledge. And I think that's where we can actually have progress. Wow. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Look, we, I'm going to ask one more question, and we are going to take five minutes for questions. So if you do have one, please summarize it into a question, not a comment in one question. We're I'm a double barreled. Um, <clears throat> it's fine. I'm going to give you this question because I suspect you have opinions on this one. <laughs> what would your ideal workplace transformation look like and be radical? I'd like to pass it off to Shankar, actually. <laughs> Because we've had lots of conversations about this over the years. We've shared certain workplaces, so. I'd like to pass this on to shit. No. Um, <laughs> so I think the ideal workplace, what does it look like? It's, it's a workplace where we recognise that psychological safety <laughs> is not just a moral imperative. <coughs> it's not just a human rights conversation about creating culturally and psychologically safe workplaces, but that we actually realise that we can address some of the world's biggest problems when workers bring their best selves to work, when we actually recognise and value lived experience, where we actually understand that diversity is not just cultural diversity or mm. gender diversity or age diversity or ability diversity, but all the diversities in thinking and addressing problems and looking innovatively in long-standing issues, that we recognise the role of power and privilege in making some people shut up and just take it and the other people continue to be in leadership roles. I was in a, I was in a, uh, um, in a forum recently, uh, the directors and CEOs of local governments all in one room and I was the only person of colour in the entire room and it wasn't a matter of just lacking of colour, it, it was the lacking of ideas, mm. lacking of experience, knowledge. Right? You know, when we've got major climate disasters and issues affecting all of us, diversity and inclusion and psychologically safe workplaces is going to be key for us to work together to try and find out what those solutions are. In some ways, I think that regional rural communities in this state understand that because they, they see their stagnation. They see their cities and towns literally dying without growth, without innovation. So I think an important sense, we imagine what that amazing workplace can be. It's our colleagues openly truth-telling and speaking about what their experiences are before they leave, before they quiet quit, before they burn out, before they file a complaint with the Victorian Human Rights Equal Opportunity Commission, 
right? And I think those are the kinds of things that we need to think about as a state is how do we actually have these important critical conversations about this is, this is for all of us. This is not just a brown people issue. This is not just an LGBTQI issue. This is about all of us. This is about the, the world that we want our children to inherit. Um, so I think that's when I think about, you know, the ideal workplace is recognising that we're all in this and this is not just, a, this is not just for Harmony Week. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Um, did you want to talk to me, May or Shithal, also about your ideas of radical transformation, what it would look like in the workplace? I, I think that the, the inclusion, psychological safety and diversity trifecta, is that's it. It's a be all end all. It shouldn't be rocket science, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the floor? We've got a couple of minutes left for one or two questions. Oh, there we go. The microphone for her. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Sure, yeah sure. go for it. Uh, thank you all. Uh, what a beautiful panel. And uh, I appreciate uh, the work of everyone. I just wanted to ask about representation. You've spoken about the lack of representation across leadership. And I want to pinpoint currently in the UK government, we see uh, black and brown people in government. But are they representative of, of, of our values? And what do you uh, suggest when uh, we see black and brown people in power, but they're not necessarily? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. How do we as individuals who understand that we need to also um, dismantle white supremacy and um, also the fact that black and brown people can also uh, continue to keep it going? So what, what, what can we do in this instance? I think two things can be true at the same time. Visibility of someone holding space in a place where they haven't held space before is good, but they could also be not representative of policies uh, and practices that are good for the people that they represent. Um, those two things can be true at the same time. Um, that's probably one point that I'd, I'd, I'd really like to stress with that. The visibility thing for me is, um, and I suppose for everyone, um, but. One of the roles that I um, have the privilege of holding is um, as a counselor on the Queensland Law Society. It's an elected position, um, and I, I'm the first woman of color in its 150 year history to hold that position. That's, thank you. But you won't find that written anywhere, and I can't have a conversation about that with anyone. Um, there's no data collected on that. If I try to suggest it, it's just skirted on, oh, someone else might have been, and points to some Anglo-Saxon woman, and I'm not quite sure how that's a person of color, but I'm, what do I know? Um, so I think the representation is important because I've had, um, and I say privilege, and I don't take that lightly, people from the next generation of lawyers come up and say, I didn't know that that was possible because they'd never seen people in that space or holding that space or starting their own firm or doing their own thing. Um, and, and that's powerful. Whether I'm reflective of the values, um, I would hope that I am. Um, but the representation in itself, as, as you would know, as people who are, are holding spaces and doing the advocacy work, is really important. Um, but that doesn't always mean, and I think it was Ruby who had said, you don't have to be white to be white. Um, you could have, you can embody uh, white ideals by being a person of color as well. Um, so those two things can be true at the same time. Yeah, I'd love, love that answer. Thank you. I want to add to that. That question you asked about certain people in positions of influence who are of color but toe the company line, so to speak. I'd like to give you all a piece of advice on, on how to think about that. Hmm. We like that we, we're told that, oh, they're here now as a person of color and they're representative of the communities because that's what we like to always think. And that's just their opinion, right? And as a person of color, you have to respect their opinion. What I put to you is that they're there because that's their opinion. You see? Mm -hmm. They make it up the food chain because that's the, they've, they've been conditioned, they've been trained, they've become a pet. They know what questions to ask and not to ask, which is why Lydia Thorpe got uh, interviewed the way she did on the 7 p.m. project, which is why Hiridia Lumumba got interviewed the way he got on the 7 p.m. project, because the person interviewing him mm. has been conditioned to know, if, just like we all have in this room. How many people here have been worried to lose their job and want to talk about because they want to talk about racism? 
half the room's hands went up. I know half a dozen of you personally have, have moved on from organizations. So we know that if we don't tow the company line, our jobs are at risk. So we are socially conditioned to understand that if you want to stay here and have a successful career in media, in law, in finance, then you are going to take on those ideological beliefs that benefit the system. We need to have a conversation about that because we, I was having this conversation with brother Phil Saunders yesterday. It happens in the US, it happens here, whether it's the Candace Owens and the John McWaters or whether it's the Mundanes here or whether it's, you know, whoever it happens to be. Those people's perspectives is, is the reason why they got to that position and we can't allow that to continue happening and think that that's, that's what the Aboriginal community thinks because one person that we pan-picked agrees with what we just had to say. So that's where diversity and inclusion, separate from each other, don't work. Just the, the presence of color doesn't make your salad diverse. Like you've got to feel included, and that comes back to Shankar and May's point about psychological safety, um, and that's what we don't have just yet. The, other, the one point I'd quickly add to that around representation is that if you are a person of color in a white organization, you automatically maybe assume that you have to carry the burden for the entire freaking sector, right? If you're that one person in the Victorian local government sector out of 79 local councils and there's the one brown person, you might think, sure, I've got to do something about this. And there's something to be really weary of that, right, as well, is like the emotional labour, right, of going, I want to wake up in the morning today and just go and do my job and come home. That's it. You know? Um, and I think that's, that's the other issue about representation is if you happen to be that one token refugee rights campaign Amnesty International, um, you know... <laughs> What, hypothetically, what's the, speaking. hypothetically speaking, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, what, what what does that mean for you? You've got to look after yourself as well, and I think that you know representation is a system issue. Oh, it's about policies and procedures, and it's not just the number of brown people in a room and what what expectations are on them. Shankar, can we also have we we we, coll we work together as well, and through the the. Um, tension and the friction of the, of the situation that we've been put in, we've actually come to have a great, much greater uh, deal of respect for each other than when we first had, which was already quite a bit. But through what we've been through together, and this dynamic is something that we, we all face, there are moments where I would face uh, racism in a context where we were in the same room together, proverbially, digitally, in the same in the conference together, where I wasn't able to, um, where I didn't feel psych psychologically safe, and the comment that was made to me in a meeting that I was actually there consulting for them was that everyone, 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 this whole conversation about anti-racism is all good and well, but what I want to do is I want to create a world where one day someone like you can have a job like mine. <laughs> That's an ally saying this to me, a person who earns a salary saying this to me, who's advocating on my behalf saying this to me, and because of that psychological safety that we don't have, Shankar's standing there next to me, but he's got a gun behind his back, and I don't see that gun behind his back, right? I expect him to be furious like I am. And I said to this person, you could have got away with that maybe, to speak to me, to my father like that when he got here 40 years ago, but you can't speak to me like that anymore, unfortunately, my friend. Because I, I, I'm not an illiterate person that you can put, play saviour with. I've got a master's in communication for social change, and I do have the qualifications to have your job as it stands right now. Needless to say, I never work with that particular organisation ever again. But because of the psychological safety that Shankar didn't have in that situation, I felt let down by him. But we need to unpack this stuff and understand it's not Shankar and I's problem to solve. It's the systems that allow us to not feel emotionally, mm. psychologically, financially stable and safe to be able to do these, what we need to do to be able to support each other. So we have to have that conversation so that no longer I need to look at a room full of people like you and know at least six of you have lost your jobs because you wanted to talk about racism in the workplace. Can I, can I just say, Irfan, you are now running your own conferences so you can tell that, that guy, whoever it was. He knows who he is. <laughs> exactly what the deal is. Look, we have time for one more question, then we are going to break. Yes, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, speaking of employment equity and the evolution of workplace, we're hearing a lot about this so-called skills shortage in Australia. Now, I know as a recruiting manager myself working for a not-for-profit, there is no um, skills, skill, skill shortage in this country. Uh, I'd like to hear your views on that. 
Um, I also want to say that, again, as someone who hires people in my own small team, I've ditched and changed PDs to make it very simple, to make it accessible, to make it inclusive, to, um, I say, very radically change the way in which I recruit people. I'm very curious when I read people's CVs and whatnot and invite them for an interview. Um, but mm -hmm. as well as being aware that when I do employ people, that it's my responsibility to create a psychologically safe space. Mm. So on this idea of skill shortage, mm. what are your thoughts? I might just start by saying that we, it does exist. We, we do have a national skill shortage. Um, but I work in an environment. I hopefully still by the end of the day, I will still be in that environment. <laughs> where we've got local government across the state of Victoria nationally who can be so desperate to fill vacancies that are not, you know, being filled, but will quite literally not do the kind of work that you've done and actually revisit your recruitment practices, look at what are we asking people to do to put an application in and sit there with their vacancies and not have those migrant, refugee, asylum seeker workers, other underrepresented communities coming into their workforce because they're so adamant that they need to hold on to their existing recruitment methods and, and, and all that sort of stuff. You know, there's like, I'd, I remember talking to a HR person and they're like, we might have some school crossing supervisor roles, you know, that we can offer your project. And I'm, I'm like, you've got vacancies. Mm -hmm. Why can't you reimagine how you fill those vacancies? So my frustration is that, yes, we do have a national skills shortage, but people seem, still don't seem to understand why diversity is going to help the business bottom line. And it's not some moral agenda that we're actually encouraging here, but actually these people have skills. They've got experience. So bring them into the organisation and to do what you need to do to change that intake process so that they can be better off, you can be better off, we can all be better off. I think it's a recognition of skills shortage more than an actual skills shortage. Um, even when you look at the migration policies, in, in it's a points-based system to be a, a skilled independent uh, to come to Australia. So you have to be highly qualified to get the amount of points and be young and all of these things, and then come here and be a checkout chick at Woolies. Um, Canada is no different. Most of the Western countries are the same. You have to be so highly skilled and qualified to come to this country, mm -hmm. yet when you do, uh, we won't recognize that uh, level of accreditation. And you'll have to go through the whole process again to become the lawyer again, to become the doctor again, and, and do all of these things. So it's a recognition of skills. And that's a systemic issue, as, as they all are, um, that a system that requires you to be of this level, of this education, yet when you come and we allow you into the country, you can't be recognized at the level that you're required to be to come in to begin with. Um, so I think that, yeah. that recognition of skills is an issue. I think in terms of also skills, there's, whether there's kind of on face value a skills shortage and certain technical skills that we need to retrain. There's a conversation around retraining, mm -hmm. our agility as humans, our agility as organizations. There's also, the flip side of that is, the world is constantly changing. A lot of my work is with entrepreneurs who are pushing the envelope with technology, awesome. There's obviously a huge dark side to that. But the one thing that is constant is that human skills are not replaceable. Mm -hmm. And no matter what industry we're in, human skills are future skills. Um, and our ability to be empathetic, our ability to be resilient, our ability to kind of have cognitive agility, these are the things that we're going to be rewarded for as a society and that ultimately are gonna allow us to, to change jobs. So I think your question goes to, yes, there's a skills shortage, but what is the thing that won't change that we all need to be educated in from school it's not a, you know, I learned Pythagoras theorem. I would have much rather learned how to uh, regulate my emotions and about the systematic <laughs> disadvantage. And I say that, you know, my father is a, is a mathematician with no disrespect to him, but I, there are much more important skills that we're not learning in terms of social intelligence, relational intelligence, the systems that 
um, allow us to, to think and feel the way we do. I also think that um, it's not enough to simply reskill people and expect that we can hire them. Like, let's, there's a lot of in incredible interventions, hiring blindly, making sure that we're bringing people in. But D without I, without inclusion, is not enough. And so what we see is that people are not actually staying. So even if people are skilled, are being brought into organizations, attrition is huge. <laughs> And retention is actually the problem. Um, numerical equality is the wrong goal. And it doesn't matter what sector we're in. We see, for example, in technology, we see a lot of women going into STEM. And we're suddenly celebrating that. Amazing. Women in Australia are now in tech. It's BS because the rates of attrition in this industry are much higher than the rates of entry. Why? Because we're entering misogynistic, patriarchal workplaces that don't allow our voices to thrive. So including the right skills is part of the problem, but we need to actually disaggregate the data and also measure retention, promotion, and disaggregate it along both gender and race lines because women of color are not there, right? So that's also part of the conversation that we're missing. Thank you, May. I think that's a brilliant note to end this session on. I think inter interrogating how we work, why we work, you know, when's the right time, what is well-being, how to reimagine things, uh, whether it's interrogating what leadership should look like to what agency is for individuals. You, you've covered so much in just over an hour. I know we went over time, but I want to thank you all for, for, for staying the course and thank our incredible panellists in um, Shithil Diom, May Samari. <laughs>